leave the taxpayer on the hook for that. Yowza, there's lots to get to. Let's get to it. Uh, first, Kian Bext of the Counter Signal is interviewing liberal ministers who are right now at their three day retreat. The three day retreat, the headline thing that they're supposed to be dealing with is supposed to be the housing issues. And instead of dealing with that, this minister's out smoking a cigar, hanging out, and he doesn't want to answer any of Kian's questions. And I'm not surprised by that or anything like that, but I'm disappointed, right? I'm disappointed. Here's Kian. He says, wow, I'm so thankful that the Trudeau government gave the counter signal an exclusive interview with the Minister of Public Safety. He was laughing and enjoying a Cuban cigar while emergency services across the country struggled to function. And he says, please support the counter signal. There you go. So here is that interaction. Mr. LeBlanc, could you tell me, do you know what the unemployment rate is right now? I, we're not actually doing interviews on our bench here. Today. Oh, you're just smoking a cigar while millions of Canadians suffer from wildfires and are unemployed. No, I'm talking to some colleagues of mine. How's the cigar? Have a nice evening. Could you tell me uh, why nice Minister yeah, Stephen nice. Gilbo is serving the Chinese Communist Party? <laughs> I think you spent too much time with a tinfoil hat on. Really, because we actually have the documents to prove it, and we know that your government has given them... 1.6 million dollars. Did you buy that appointment, that communist appointment? I'm sorry to interrupt your cigar you're not, break. You're not busy, are you, tonight, obviously? Just speaking with you? Yeah, it's too bad, actually. Why is that? You're afraid Canadians would get some answers from you corrupt liberals? How much money did this whole convention cost? It's actually not a convention, it's a meeting. Slimy, 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 right? transparency, such sunny ways. Unbelievable, unbelievable arrogance from these liberals, right? Here is Blacklock's reporter. They're reporting federal investigators confirm illegal voting in Calgary Skyview, including PMO staffer who broke the election act to cast a ballot for MP George Shal Shalal. I'm I never say his name right. I think they linked the wrong person as well. Yes, they definitely linked the wrong person. Um, so very interesting stuff. Weird, right? Um, Weird, weird, crazy things going on. Here's here's the MP's Twitter, and they did link the wrong one. You can see that the person who's linked is a different, like they've got a different. It's it's a woman, so it's it's a woman. It's not it's not the MP, but the MP's Twitter is Shalal George, and so there you go. So he hasn't gone into protective or anything like that. He was, it was just linked wrong. But anyway, regardless of all of that. Um, it is very, very interesting that the um, casting of illegal ballots is is kind of a footnote. It's it's kind of an afterthought, right? It's not it's not something that is front and center. Like, oh no, we've got to get to the bottom of these illegal votes. And and it's one of the reasons that I think that our elections aren't very um, reliable. The the results are not very reliable. I don't think they reflect the will of the people. And it seems they're suspect. I think they're suspect. I I don't trust them. And people say, oh well, they're hand counted. They must be perfect. They're not perfect. There's influence that matters. Google themselves say they influence web. Uh, they influence election results by up to ten percent, six to ten percent, which is a huge huge in politics six to ten percent is a massive swing especially when elections are won at one two one or one percent like 49 48 to 49 you know what i mean like there's a very 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 thin margins and so if google's influencing things by what they prioritize when somebody googles a candidate and things to that effect how much does facebook um, change things how much do the editorials how much do the, does the fake news how much does the fact that that controversial candidates get removed from social media how much does the fact that controversial candidates and and they're not even controversial controversial in that they threaten the current order of things because they are not tolerating the corruption um so they get cut out those people the people saying you know what we should probably do stop sending money to ukraine that man can't be a woman those people right those things are not controversial things to say in canada but they are right? Because of the narrative that we're, ex we are expected to accept. And it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. And, and so we can't talk about these things, but people who do talk about these things don't win elections because they're sidelines in sidelined in various ways. Even so, I think they do better than what the, what the votes reflect. And I think that our, our elections are hinky. So, I mean, you know, apparently that's against the law in the, in the United States. You're not allowed to question elections in the United States. These election results are are ironclad we have the the most free elections in the world and if you question that we will put you in the gulag comrade jeepers creepers the trudeau liberals are gaslighting canadians says the toronto sun the trudeau government 
the Trudeau government's dog-eared playbook of calling opponents evil has reached the point of absurdity. Disagree with the Prime Minister Justin Trudeau uh, and his carbon tax and former Environment Minister Catherine McKenna will accuse you of being an arsonist. Object to their plan to bring in almost 1.5 million immigrants between now and 2025 contributing to Canada's housing crisis and Immigration Minister Mark Miller will suggest you're among a segment of folks that have that have blamed immigrants for taking houses, taking jobs, you name it. Express anger about Beijing's uh, dictators interfering in our democracy. And Trudeau will reply that one of the things we've seen, unfortunately, over the past years is a rise in anti-Asian racism linked to the pandemic and concerns being raised or arisen around people's loyalties. This despite the fact that that numerous leaders and organizations representing Canadians of Chinese origin have repeatedly called for a public inquiry into foreign interference while Trudeau continues to rag the puck on calling calling one. Criticizing Trudeau's decision to invoke the Emergencies Act and the protest against his government and Trudeau will liken you to supporting people who wave swastikas as as if it would be impossible to protest federal pandemic policies for legitimate reasons. Voice as a Muslim parent concerned about gender ideology and classes in public schools, and the prime minister will say you're being influenced by the American right wing, spreading misinformation and disinformation as if no one could have genuine concerns about the issue. Trudeau's MPs know what's going on. Many of them spread these accusations on social media every day. Rarely do any of them call it out as liberal MP Joel Lightbound, Lightbound admittedly did after the 2021 federal election. Objecting to Trudeau's weaponization of vaccine mandates during the campaign, Lightbound said, I can't help but notice with great regret, or with regret, excuse me, that that the, both the tone and policies of my government changed drastically on the eve and during the last election campaign. From a positive and unifying approach, a decision was made to wedge, to divide, and to stigmatize. Now that we have one of the most vaccinated populations in the world, we've never been so divided. We're divided because the leader of our country routinely portrays Canadians who disagree with him, not just as wrong, but evil. Right? Yeah, pretty wild stuff. And it's it's not incorrect. The National Post is pointing the same thing out. The far right only exists in the mind of paranoid progressives. Liberals, not conservatives, are the true heirs of European fascism. And they say the phrase far right intended to draw unfavorable comparisons to the 1920s and 30s European fascism have been twisted into nothing more than a way to smear anyone right of center as unforgivably extreme or racist, no matter what their actual policies are. Earlier this summer, then housing minister Ahmed Hassan accused conservative leader Pierre Polyev of using far right rhetoric when criticizing the government's housing policy. Policy. Foreign Affairs Minister Melanie Jolie told the Quebec radio station last week that the Conservatives were undergoing a far-right radicalization. One journalist recently asked Polyev about dog whistling to the far right, but was unable to say who was actually making the allegation. And it was funny to watch because Polyev just didn't let it go and then slammed the reporter down when when uh, she asked him to actually ask, ask the question that was really just not a question at all, right? Uh, True North, so so it was fun to watch, but um, it, it's interesting. I don't know if it's going to translate. I don't, it will, it will. I think that I think that Trudeau is being ushered out on purpose. True North is reporting. Newly released statistics by the BC Center for Disease Control shows that overdoses were the leading cause of death for those uh, under 18 in the province last year. And this is liberal policy on steroids. The idea that safe injection sites somehow make an unsafe substance safe to inject and not stigmatizing drug use, but allowing drugs to be used at whatever rate you want and uh, not finding that a problem is is strange. You know, like, especially if you're talking marijuana, that's one thing. If you're talking, and, and I mean, there's an argument, I guess, on both sides, but but I think marijuana uh, can be, when you compare it to heroin, pretty benign. Marijuana doesn't kill you. You don't get. There's no lethal dose of marijuana, as far as I've heard, ever. I don't think anybody's ever, ever smoked themselves with marijuana to death, and so that's interesting to me. And whereas heroin or fentanyl, a lot of people die of that. So, on on one hand, if the community wants to grow marijuana for potheads, okay, you know, if put a greenhouse up, give the potheads their pot if you want, right? Sure. But the idea that let listen this guy really likes heroin or fentanyl. And we heard that there's some bad fentanyl on the street. And the way to to mitigate this bad fentanyl that could kill him, this person, uh, this community member of ours, um, 
we're going to give him a safe supply of the drug that he wants. It seems really crazy. We all agree that the drugs, doing drugs is, is not great. Doing drugs is counter to taking your role in society, probably. I mean, probably, probably not. There are functional alcoholics. There are people who take drugs and are also able to do all their responsibilities. I'm not talking about people like that. I'm talking about people who are just hanging out at the safe injection site to get drugs. That's, that's more what I'm talking about. If you're that dependent on drugs, you're not contributing positively to society. So why is society subsidizing that behavior? It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. Why are we paying for it? Why are we paying for it? And in Guelph, just as one example, Guelph's where I live, Guelph had, when we opened the safe injection site that year and the year after, the, in, the overdose deaths doubled. Why are we killing people? Is this just a, an alternate to made? Why is that acceptable to people? It's crazy. It's crazy. Okay, we have to talk about housing. Pierre Polyev, he says, really looking forward to seeing all the lower housing costs that will come out of Trudeau's big cabinet retreat. He doubled the cost of housing, but no doubt this latest meeting will produce brilliant solutions. And we saw what was happening at the meeting, right? There was the, the cigars out on the, uh, out on the porch there, right? So do you think solutions will come out of this meeting? I don't think so. Here's the prepper for what's coming and what Polyev is proposing how to fix housing. We can't, if we build one-tenth, 100,000 of a million people, one-tenth the supply needed for that population, we are not responsible with our policies regarding immigration. It's a very bad idea to do that because the supply will not be enough, the demand will continue to be high, and so the price will continue to stay high regardless of the high interest rates. Everybody suffers because of these false economic signals that get sent by this high immigration because everybody's under pressure to have somewhere to live, right? Oh, affordable housing. What does that even mean anymore, affordable housing? Here's Chris Guy talking about how they're going to roll this into 15-minute cities. I think he's not far off. Here we go. Designing these new little mini cities that they call districts, where your building is going to have 500 or 600 units for living, then it's going to have office space, then it's going to have retail, all in the same building. Meanwhile, it's only going to have a few parking spaces. They're literally putting huge signs in the streets, and they all look exactly the same, and it says City of Toronto Rezoning, and they are all identical. You'll see a building that was there previously getting torn down, and you're going to see what they call a mixed-use development, and it has residences on top, office buildings and retail in the middle and the bottom, and then almost no infrastructure for parking. There's not even enough parking for the people living there. You're supposed to live upstairs, work somewhere in the building, Go to the gym or your Starbucks or your grocery store. Everything in the building. So basically, you're living on lockdown your entire life, just like they wanted you to do with COVID. Remember with COVID when you were on lockdown and they said you couldn't go more than five kilometers away from your house? Well, if you don't have a car, guess what? You're never going to go more than five yeah. kilometers away from your house. And that's what the 15-minute city is designed to do. Right? So even if you're going on transit, right, you're going to a grocery store that's probably not too far away because you can't pick and choose because you're dr taking a bus. You can't go to one store and another store and shop around. You can go to one store because that's the store that's closest to you. So they can gouge prices as much as they want. Wild. Riley, Riley says, Polyev was asked twice on Red FM Canada if he would lower immigration to reduce the housing costs. He dodged the question both times, emphasize, emphasizing how he would build a huge number of homes. Is this an appropriate response from the leader of Canada's Conservative Party? Conservative Party. Here we go. If that annual number, annual number of immigration should be reduced. Well, what we need is the housing construction to be increased. If we build the houses, we can accommodate the newcomers. But we have to pick. Either we have high immigration with high home building, or we have the opposite. But we can't have high immigration while we don't build homes. And, and that's the, what Trudeau's got backwards. I'm sure I, I, uh, it's all well and good to bring in more people, but you have to build homes. And this year, housing construction under Trudeau is down 32%. We're, t we're going to be, by 2030, under the current trajectory, we're going to be short 3.5 million homes. Where are 3.5 million people going to live? I mean, the, 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 it will be good news for the, uh, the camping uh, stores because they'll be selling tents uh, in record numbers. Uh, but we need to build those millions of homes starting today if we're going to house all the, the people we're bringing in.
that our current goals of adding 1% of the population, do you, do you believe these are sustainable? Well, last year it wasn't 1%. It was well over 2%. It was a, a million people. We grew by a million people in one year on a base of 39 million. So it's 2.5% per, per year uh, more recently. Um, you know, I would point out we built more homes in 1972 than we built last year. In 1972, we had 22 million people. Last year, we had 39 million people. So we have almost doubled the population, and we're building fewer homes. We're headed to a disaster. Um, one of the things he says, it's all well and good to bring in people, but you have to find places for them to live. Is it all well and good to bring in people? If, we're, if we can't find places for them to live, what, are, what about the other services like healthcare, education? If we bring in that many people, do we have enough everything else to cover it and, I, and the answer is no i don't think we have the right health care for the level of population we've got now in the, in the country and so that's concerning don't you think so mr polyev wants to build baby build and here's mr polyev highlighting scott aitchison's video scott aitchison's got a video talking about how he wants to repurpose this building into a tower that will be multi-use Right, just like Chris Guy was just talking about. Pierre Polyev, he says, Shadow Housing Minister Aitchison nails it. Sell off useless government buildings to build homes next to transit. And bring it home. The, this post office in Burnaby could have apartments for young people, seniors, and workers above it. Mayor Hurley in Burnaby begged for it to be turned into housing, but the federal government said no. Find the lazy land and turn it into home, homes people need. Here's the video. So it doesn't take a PhD to understand that this is underutilized lands. Right now, it's a decades-long process to determine that that federal property is surplus. All around us is high-density residential. There's a SkyTrain station just down the block. This is where housing has to be, but the federal government's not on board. Meanwhile, across the street, showing pictures of high-rises. So look at this. Here we are high density residential right next to transit. This is exactly the kind of development we need next to transit all across this country. We need to pre-zone, get things ready to go, and any investment the federal government makes in urban transit has to have this around it. So it doesn't take a PhD. So there you go. Um, the idea is selling it to you like we're solving the problem. I just don't think, I, I don't think that building is a solution to the problem. A building is trying to keep up with the problem that is ongoing. And it's, it's not going to do that because of the material costs are too high. The labor costs are too high. Tab, table Salt says, how absurd are housing prices at 7% mortgage rates? A top 5% income earner family in Ontario, that's 160 odd thousand dollars a year, cannot afford an average apartment condo in the GTA. That's seven thousand or seven hundred thousand thirty-seven, seven hundred and thirty-seven thousand dollars. Bah! Uh, they'd only be approved at a six hundred and thirty-three thousand dollar mortgage, and only if they have no debt. So a six hundred and thirty-three thousand dollar mortgage. If you don't have a car loan and you don't have anything else hanging over you, any any debt at all. So that's that's pretty crazy, right? Here is Pierre Polyev sharing this housing thing. Uh, inmates now ask to stay in jail because they can't afford a home outside. The Trudeau housing market is literally worse than prison for many. So here you go. Prisoners in BC are reportedly asking for extensions to their jail sentences due to the province's housing crisis. Because the average home prices in Vancouver is almost $1.5 million and the average rent for a one bedroom is 3000 And BC is one of the provinces with the largest homeless population with over 9,000 people experiencing homelessness. Prisoners in BC are reportedly so asking pretty. for extensions to their jail sentences. Sorry, I thought there was one more little segment. That's pretty crazy. That's pretty wild stuff, right? Like, uh, I'd like to, can I just stay? <laughs> I'm going to hang out here. Give me, I, I'm going to go out and commit a murder. <laughs> no, I'm not. Um, but like making a threat to like, you don't want more crime. I'll just hang out here. Like, give me another six months. I got to find a place to live, you know, right? Like, Duncan says, Duncan D is a an ex, -air, former airline COO, former Hill staffer, volunteer in Haiti. Uh, he says, so... 
as Immigration Minister Sean Fraser issued student visas to anyone who wanted one, and Canadian universities happily admitted anyone because they pay ridiculous tuition fees. Now, as a housing minister, he, reali he realizes his, visa his visas contributed to the housing crisis. What's his next portfolio? So he's responding to Brian. Brian says, Canada's housing minister, Sean Fraser, says the massive increase in inter international students over the past decade has had a pronounced impact on housing markets, asked if Canada should cap international student visas. He says, I think it's one of the options that we ought to consider. So I don't think they're actually going to follow through with that, though, because the universities depend on. Hello, everyone. Thanks very much for watching. This is just a short version of a longer show. If you'd like to get the whole show, you can go over to CanadaPoly.com and sign up for a subscription. Just look in the drop down tab for shop and donate and look for subscriptions and you'll get immediate access to the full show. Love to see you. Thanks for watching, everybody. Have a wonderful, wonderful.